Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is indeed a blessing. It is a privilege, an awesome privilege at that, uh, to be able to uh, bring the Word of God to you. I thank the Lord uh, for giving me this opportunity, and I pray that uh, the message that I have today will be a blessing to all of you uh, who are here. And with that, I go into my message which today is from the 103rd Psalm and we'll just be looking at some reasons why we should praise God. Um, the psalmist starts off by saying bless the Lord which means praise the Lord and so we want to look at some reasons why we should praise God because these uh, things was written also uh, to be instruction and uh, a blessing to us. So with that, uh, we'll look at this uh, 103rd Psalm. And the psalmist starts off by saying, uh, Bless the Lord, or praise the Lord, O my soul. And uh, to bless the Lord means to declare to the Lord, or maybe you're talking to someone uh, to state something about the Lord, to state this about the Lord. To declare to the Lord our regard and our appreciation for Him. And we should do that uh, often, whether we are alone or if we are in the midst or the presence of others. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul. So he is speaking to himself. He's telling himself uh, to bless the Lord. The Word of God tells us that we are to offer up to God sacrifices of praises and thanksgiving continually. That is the fruit of our lips, Hebrews 13 and 15. But you know, um, sometimes we have to remind ourselves. Sometimes we have to encourage or maybe even push ourselves uh, to praise the Lord. It might not be too hard in times of joy, but sometimes it's kind of rough for us to do it. Uh, in times of distress, when troubles comes. Uh, but uh, praise, praising God when troubles come, praising God when we find, our, find ourselves uh, uh, in distress, whatever our circumstances might be, praising God can actually help us. Praising God, even in the time of distress, 
can keep us from getting panicky, keep us from overreacting, uh, protect us from total despair, and also even keeping us keep us from uh, uh, displaying resentment against God because of the things that He allows to come uh, in our, our life. So it is uh, very beneficial. Uh, for us to praise the Lord, whether things seem to us to be going well or whether or not things seem uh, to us seem to be going uh, badly uh, for us. We are to praise the Lord. And uh, the psalmist says, and all that is within me, all that is within me, we should uh, praise the Lord. And of course, that means we should do it with enthusiasm. Uh, whether our circumstances, again, seem to us to be good or bad, uh, for whatever reason, we ought to praise the Lord with our whole heart. We ought to use all of our faculties uh, to praise the Lord. We ought to use uh, our intellect. We ought to use our emotions. We, you can uh, praise the God and, and, and cry at the same time, not because things are so bad, but because he is so good. But all that is within us, we ought to, the psalmist says, bless his holy name. Bless his holy name or praise his holy name. Now, by name here, the psalmist is talking about God's character. The totality of God's character. We need to praise God for who he is. We need to praise God for how he is. We need to praise God for what he has done. Uh, we need to bless his holy name. His name, his character is holy. His character, we need to praise his character because God is totally, 100%. And eternally holy. God is supremely holy. There is none holier than God. So we need to praise him uh, for that reason as well. And the psalmist then tells us to forget not. To forget not. Always be mindful of. Always keep in memory uh, God's benefits that he bestows upon us. And you know it's easy for us to forget God's mercy toward us. It's easy for us to forget how watchful God is toward us. Uh, regarding dangers seen and regarding dangers unseen. It's easy to forget at times uh, how God provides for us. And uh, uh, especially, you know, like I say, when, when, when troubles come, when, when things are going uh, badly for us, and sometimes we do just like the nation of Israel did, whom God uh, rescued from uh, the, uh, the abuse of the Egyptians, rescued them uh, from bondage out of Egypt. And then what did they do shortly after they got out of Egypt? Every time they ran into a hardship. And we do the same things uh, too. Uh, they were murmuring and complaining. And one of the reasons why they was doing it because God gave them what they needed instead of what they wanted. He gave them what they needed instead of what they wanted. And God does that with uh, us too. He gives us oftentimes sometimes what we want but he gives us oftentimes what we need what is best for us instead of what we want and when uh god doesn't give us what we want or he allows us to experience things that we normally uh, wouldn't choose uh, to experience we want to make sure that we don't take that attitude uh that israel took uh, they took that god ain't done much for me lately attitude every time things didn't go the way that they want them, wanted them to go. For example, in Numbers chapter 11, uh, we look at verses 1, 4, uh, 6, and 10, and it says, Now the people became like those who complain in adversity in the hearing of the Lord. We know, want to make sure now when we get to murmuring and complaining that the Lord does hear us. They began to complain in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard, his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. Uh, we don't want God to have to uh, uh, demonstrate his displeasure because of our unthankfulness and because of our unnecessarily uh, uh, complaining spirit. Uh, we don't want to kindle the anger of the Lord. So God, uh, he sent fire among them and it consumed some of those that were on the outskirts of the camp. But... Did that cure them? Nope. Uh, and then it goes on to say, And the rabble who were among them had greedy desires. And the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt, and the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. Well, maybe that's, they had all of that, but I wonder did they remember the whips? 
uh, the time that they had to make uh, uh, straw or bricks without straw, uh, how uh, 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 the Egyptians were abusing them uh, while they were in slavery. They talk about, we remember the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but you was crying unto the Lord to get you out from under the abuse of the Egyptians. Now you're out in the wilderness, God giving you what you need, which was manna, bread from heaven, uh, as it referred to. He's giving you what you need instead of what you want, and now you're complaining about how good you had it in Egypt. Uh, do we do that too? Uh, been saved, God had mercy on us and delivered us from death unto life, and then things start going wrong, and we talking about, man, I had it better when I was out there in the world. Man, I was hustling, making all kind of uh, money, and, uh, you know, doing this and doing that. And I had him, and I had her, and they uh, kept you crying all the time, uh, beating you down the times you went to jail uh, because of uh, your foolishness. And now you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, how good you had it uh, when you was out in the world. And things like that anger the Lord. And even if we had uh, 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 everything was coming up roses uh, for us in the world, uh, the problem is, is all we had to do was die and we was going to wind up in hell. But God kept us from that. So we didn't have it good in the world. It might have been good to us, but it wasn't good for us. And so uh, they begin to complain about uh, we ain't got nothing to eat but this manna. That's all we got to eat is this manna. And it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Because God was giving them what they needed and not what they wanted. Because what they wanted wasn't going to be as beneficial to them as the things that he was giving them uh, that they needed, including the manna. Well, it goes on to say, then they set out from Mount Hor to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. And the people spoke against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Can anybody say he, they was talking to God at the same time? Why have you brought us up, uh, uh, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we loathe, uh, we sick of, we tired of this miserable food. Talking about the manna. You know, uh, I don't want to complain about and not so much that I don't have something, but it ain't precisely what I want. But it might be a good idea not to complain about it because God say, he might say, well, if you can't take that, you can't stand it. I just take it all away and then you don't have nothing. So we should uh, be thankful to God uh, for whatever he gives us. But they were complaining. We sick of this uh, uh, manna. Uh, one time they said they wanted some meat to eat. So God said, I'm going to give you some. Okay, uh, tell them I'm going to send them some quail. So they got some quail, they cooked the quail, and they was eating it. And they said while they was yet eating the quail, uh, God sent a plague among them because of their complaining, because of their unthankfulness. Uh, so when he was talking about how miserable the manna was for food, it says the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of them died. Well, that was them. But God also sends a warning to us. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, God warns us uh, not to do the same thing that Israel did. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Because God killed some of them folks for doing it. And just because we're in the 21st century don't mean that God didn't change. He's still like that. He's merciful and he's gracious. But we don't want to push his patience to the point where he might have to kill us too. God always, always has a good a good reason for every unpleasant circumstance that he allows to come into our lives. I say God always has a good reason for every circumstance. Every circumstance, no matter how unpleasant it is, he's got a good reason for allowing it to come into our lives. After 40 years in the wilderness, Israel was going through uh, uh, various hardships and stuff. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is summarizing the wilderness journey, and so he starts telling them, God told Moses to tell them this. They was about to enter the promised land. And God told Moses to tell them this, remember, remember all the way, I'm talking about God always got a good reason for whatever he allowed to happen uh, to us. I don't care how painful or unpleasant it is. Remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you. You need hardships to help you to be humble. 
I need hardships to help me to be humble. Even the Apostle Paul, with all the visions that God uh, uh, gave to Apostle Paul, God, Paul said, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh to keep me from getting lifted up in pride. The Apostle Paul, yeah, well, he does the same thing with me and he does the same thing with you. God lets some things happen to humble us, to keep us from getting lifted up in pride, and also to help us to remember that our dependence is upon him, and it is not in our natural ability. So he tells Israel, I led you through the wilderness for 40 years that he might humble you. And also he said, I was testing you to know what was in your heart. Because, you know, we can uh, sometimes talk about... Uh, I promised him that I would serve him till I die. Uh, ain't nothing going to turn me around. You know, uh, that's a good desire to have, but that's not always necessarily uh, true in our lives. We might think that it is or feel like it is or had a few victories against struggles and think that's it. I've arrived, but God wants us to realize our condition. He wants us to realize that we are weak. And without him, we would fall apart. Without him, it would be a complete uh, breakdown in righteousness, a, completely, a complete breakdown in holiness. So we don't need to get lifted up in prayer. So God will sometimes let us see our weaknesses to remind us of our dependence on him. Why? Because he's on an ego trip? No, because he loves us. And we would get started thinking, I'm all that and I can do this and I got it made. We are heading for a fall. And so to keep us from disaster, God humbles us. He said, I humble you to let you know that uh, and understand that man don't live by bread alone. It ain't about what you got, what you got to eat, what you have. I mean, that's uh, necessary for life. Yeah, necessary for nourishment. Yeah, but the absolute necessity that we have or need is the word of God. Because by the knowledge of the word of God, it keeps us from disaster. The knowledge of the word of God reminds us in times of trouble how much God loves us. The knowledge of the word of God reminds us that though I'm in trial and tribulation now, I know that a better day is coming because God has already showed me the end of the story. Book of Revelation, there will be no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain, no more death, no more sin, no more struggling against sin, no more temptations, no more failures, no more tears. Knowledge of the word of God will also keep us from falling apart. And we want to remember that whatever happens in our life, it can't happen unless God allows it to happen. And if he allows it to happen, you can mark it down that God has a good reason for letting it happen. So he told Israel, I want you to remember, I did this to humble you. I did this to know what's in your heart so that you can see what's in your heart. So that you can see your weaknesses and if you got good sense, you're going to pray about it. That's why I did it. So uh, the purpose that God had for Israel and allowing them to go through hardships, uh, we ought to come to the same conclusion that he revealed to them. And, uh, you know, we don't want to focus on it here and now like uh, this life is all there is. And so we got to make the most of it. We got to have the best. We can't, ain't got time for no hardships. We can't focus on it here, uh, here and now. Uh, because if do, it'll make us blind to the fact, you know, when we get the troubles, the problems, and, and whatever, it'll make us blind to the fact that actually we in good shape. I'll say if you ain't got a dime in your pocket, if you sick, if you bent over and can't have walk, if you got pain shooting all through your body, you can't make ends meet regardless of your best efforts to do so, but yet you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are rich. You want to be, and I want to be, rich in the fruit of the Spirit. Which is best, to have a lot of money or to have your heart controlled by the love of Christ? Which is best, to have a lot of money or to have the joy of the Lord in your heart? Which is best, a lot of money, everything that a heart could wish, or the peace of God that passes all understand it. So when God says you're rich, he ain't necessarily talking about because you got all the money that you want, you got all the possessions that you want, but you got the spiritual possessions uh, that you need. You know, um, Revelation 2 and 9, uh, Jesus 
uh, to the church of Smyrna said, I know your tribulation and your poverty. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Why? Because you trust me, because you love me, because you are faithful to me. Those are the true riches, the fruit of the Spirit. I want the Lord to fill me with all of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, uh, humility, uh, faith. Against such God says there is no law. If you're rich in that as a Christian, you will do well. But on the other hand, like I said, you can have everything you want. Uh, remember what God said to the church in Laodicea? You say I'm rich. I ain't got need of nothing. And you don't know that you're poor, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're naked, and you're blind. You got a lot of possessions, but spiritually you are bankrupt. You need to repent. You need to clothe yourself. Uh, so that your nakedness won't appear. My nakedness, the Lord, Lord, I got a nice outfit. What you talking about, nakedness uh, 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 won't appear? I'm talking about your spiritual nakedness. You are spiritually naked. And you need to be clothed in the robe of righteousness, which you can only get from me. And stop boasting about, I got this and I got that. We remember the story of the, uh, of the, of the foolish rich man, don't we? You know, uh, hmm, got all this grain. Where am I going to store it? My barns is full. Oh, I know. I'll build more barns. And then I'm going to store my grain in them barns. And I'm going to say, so, you got many goods laid up for many years. Put the cigar in his mouth. So, take your ease. And God said, you fool. You ain't got the foggiest notion that tonight you're going to die. And then who are going to have those riches? And you're going to die without having prepared yourself for death, and who is going to have your riches. So we want to make sure that we have the riches that come from God, and we can only get the riches that come from God by square one, accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. Square number two, humble ourselves at all times in the sight of the Lord. So yeah, God don't want us to get caught up in that same foolishness as Israel did and walk around with that attitude like, uh, you ain't did much uh, for me lately. Uh, so whatever we're going through, uh, Jesus knows, as he said to the church of Smyrna, you know, I, I, I know your tribulation. I know your poverty. And Jesus knows also, because we want to remember Hebrews 4 and 15 says that we don't have a high priest talking about Jesus Christ who cannot be touched with the uh, feeling of our infirmities. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was in all points tempted like we are, and yet he didn't sin. He was tempted like we are, so Jesus knows exactly what we are going through. He knows how it feels uh, to be hungry. He knows how it feels to be thirsty. He knows how it feels to be in pain. He knows how it feels to be physically a bruise. Uh, he knows how it feels uh, to be uh, despised, rejected, uh, falsely accused, you name it. He's been through it. He knows how uh, we feel. And so therefore the word of God says he is able to save to the uttermost. Save us to the uttermost. Not only just the initial salvation that we got with uh, saving us from the uh, penalty of sin, but save us to the uttermost from all them bad habits we bring in, uh, 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 along with us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Bad habits that's going to trip us up, mess us up. We need to get rid of, rid of. Well, he can help us with those too. It's a process. Some things take longer than others, but he's able to do it. So um, we are not to forget his benefits. What benefits? Precisely what benefits? So the psalmist goes on to say it. He forgives all our iniquities. He forgives all our iniquities, forgives all of our sins. I ain't talking about just all the sins he forgave when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. The Word of God says that those who accept Christ are forgiven for all that they ever did. He forgives all our iniquities of the past and our sinful life. He forgives the sins that we commit against him since we've been saved. Oh yeah, since we've been saved, he forgives all of our iniquities. Uh, the word of God says, so what you know, I know, I hope ain't nothing about nobody out there talking about I don't resend this perfection because it ain't happening and it ain't going to happen. 
long as you are in this life. If you're going to reach sinful, uh, sin, sinful perfection, or I'm sorry, uh, sinless perfection, then why did God say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins? He wasn't talking to sinners, he was talking to us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Then he went on to say if we say that we have no sin, we make him a liar. I reach sinless perfection. It ain't going to happen. Uh, not in this life. He says, my little children, I'm writing unto you, saying to you, don't sin. But if you do sin, we got an advocate with the Father, like a lawyer, a go-between. And who is this advocate? Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice. Uh, King James says propitiation. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So then he forgives all of our iniquities. And again, if we don't have a dime or whatever plight we might find ourselves in, we can rejoice because of the continual forgiveness of our sins. Uh, and without that benefit, we go to hell. And the truth of the matter is we're going to be drawing on that particular uh, aspect of God's mercy uh, as long as we live, as long as we're here on this earth. It says he heals all our diseases, whether they be caused by environmental conditions Conditions, whether they are physical illnesses, whether problems that are associated with old age, or whether it's our spiritual deficiencies, uh, or if it's just because we are, are, are sick, afflicted, or uh, downcast because of judgment for sin, it says he heals all our diseases. And uh, ad adversities, problems can affect us only to the degree that God allows it. And furthermore, as children of God taught him healing all our diseases, we got the advantage of prayer. We can go to God in prayer. Even if we sin and, and, and we are sick as a result of sin, we can still go to God in prayer. And if it seems good in this uh, sight, we can get healed from it. Because what did the word of God say? If, is, is, there, are there, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray for them, anoint them with all. And it says, and if the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and if he has committed sins, It'll be forgiven him. We got the advantage of prayer. Even when we mess up and God is chastising us, we can go to God uh, for healing. And uh, if we uh, do, uh, and it seems good in, us, in, in our, uh, his sight, then he'll heal us. And But what if we do this? You know, confess our sins and call for the elders of the church, and they pray for us, they lay hands on us, anointing us with all, because we sick. Then the word of God says that if we commit the sins, they will forgive, uh, they'll be forgiven him. Yeah, but not necessarily in every case. Sometimes it might be better for you to stay sick, and keep you humble, keep you, help you to not do that stupid thing that, that you did before. The thing of it is that the word of God says if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So if it's good in his sight, he'll hear you. But if he don't, mark this down. He got something better for you. It might not be a, a, a good to you, but it's better for you. It said God redeems our life from destruction. And that's from uh, all kinds of physical dangers, dangers we see, dangers that we don't see. As many times as I go out driving, I don't know how many times I would have got killed, but God kept it from happening to me, and I didn't even know it. Talking about dangers unseen. I remember I've seen the times when I've gone out and a, a car cut in front of my car, you know, and uh, I, if, 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 if I had a hit it or he had hit me, it would have been disastrous. But God kept me from it. That's, that's dangerous uh, that we see. So he redeems our life from destruction, dangerous, unseen, unseen. And also God keeps us from suffering the full consequences of our foolish choices, foolish decisions. Because sometimes, I'm sorry, uh, we as Christians can do some dumb things. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been saved. And if you ain't been stupid lately, and if I ain't been stupid lately, it's because God's mercy is upon me. And that's what kept me from being uh, uh, stupid uh, lately. But God redeems us from destruction, even when we sin against him, knowing that we're doing the wrong thing. And God sometimes still has mercy on us. But I wouldn't push uh, God's patience because God ain't obligated to protect us. If we deliberately disobey him, sometimes he has all of us. But he ain't obligated to do it, and he don't always do it. And let me just recite one of my uh, favorite scriptures. Be not deceived, Christian. I ain't talking about sinners. Be not deceived. Don't fool yourself, Christian. God is not mocked. 
Whatever we sow, that's what we're going to reap. Do we sow to our flesh, accommodate our sin nature, give in to our sinful desires, that's sowing to the flesh, we shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if we sow to the spirit, we shall of the spirit reach life everlasting. The word goes on to say he satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. God provides us with goodness uh, according to his will. And uh, these provisions, the good things that God uh, uh, satisfies us with, they renew our physical strength. They renew our mental disposition because sometimes because of trials and tribulation, you feel out of it. You don't feel like it. But God uh, 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 pours out his goodness on us and it renews our strength. And it said it's renewed like the eagles. Renewed like the eagles? Well, what do you mean? Well, when God pulls out these blessings on us, when we down and out, beat down by trials uh, and tribulation, the goodness that he pours on, on us renews our strength so that we're able to fly, if you will, above our circumstances. Soar above our circumstances. Even though the circumstances are still there, we can soar above our circumstances. That means we can be put in the right mental frame of mind, so I'm not going to get mad at God. I ain't going to stop going to church. I ain't going to stop praying because the Lord has strengthened me. I don't know how many times I've had something that I had to do that was my duty to do as far as serving God is concerned, and I just didn't feel like I was physically, oh man, I got this here to me too. And I go to the Lord, and I said, Lord, I'm tired. I don't feel like it, but I'm asking you to give me the strength to do it. And I kid you not, he always does it. He always does it. And then when I get through, I'm talking, man, that was easy. But it wasn't easy when I was looking at it because I was all tired. But God renews our strength, so he calls us to the soil above, uh, if you will, so our, our circumstances. Uh, you know, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 and verse 31 says about God, He gives power to the weary, and to them that have no might, He increases their strength. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. That's because we don't have the strength in ourselves. We don't feel like it. But God supplies us with the strength. He renews our strength so that we can soar above our problems with the same power that the eagle has in his wings that enables him to fly. It says, the Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. That's another aspect of his character. And God showed this uh, particular aspect of his character to Moses when he, in Israel when he brought him out of Egypt. And guess what? He showed it to Pharaoh too. When Pharaoh seen them horses going under that water, then uh, Pharaoh know, hey, God really do love these people, don't he? So, you know, God opened up the Red Sea. Pharaoh saw that. God opened up the Red Sea. The children go across on, God, on dry ground. Y'all go in there and too. Go get them. They'll go to water down on them. So, yeah, God showed that uh, uh, he executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. Israel was being oppressed by the Egyptians. God showed them, I'm going to execute righteousness and judgment. I'm going to get you out of Egypt. God killed all the firstborn in Egypt. So yeah, so he showed it to Israel and he showed it to Pharaoh and we read it in the Bible and he shows it to us. And also uh, we are uh, experiencing in our own lives. Uh, you know, so sometimes we get messed over. And I tell you something, this is a bad time for Christians, you know. And unless Jesus heard them come back, it ain't going to get better. It's just going to get worse. I mean, God could send revival, but it don't look like it's none in the near future. But uh, Christians are going to be persecuted. Christians are going to be oppressed. And uh, it might look like God ain't going to do nothing. But he is going to do something. Uh, God told us, he warns us, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution, could suffer persecution. Nope. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Are you paying attention to the way the world is now? Are you looking at the hatred that's in the world, especially for people who talk about the righteousness of God, who talk about repentance of sin? So, yes, uh, the Lord executes righteousness and judgment, and uh, don't think that justice delayed is going to be justice denied, because God says he is going to avenge all of his elect. You got Christians, especially in Asia. You got Christians, especially in China. You got Christians, probably, uh, no doubt, in North Korea, who are being killed, who are being killed for their faith. And it looks like God ain't going to do nothing. Read Revelation uh, 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 chapter 6. When the Antichrist is going to behead those that refuse to take his mark 
And he said, John says, I saw the souls of those who will be hidden under the altar. And he said, how long is it going to be, Lord, before you avenge our blood? See, they waiting too. They done killed us, Lord. And I know that ain't your character to let somebody abuse your people. And you ain't going to do nothing. But God told them, rest a little while till the rest of your brothers be killed. But God is going to avenge uh, his elect. So we shouldn't worry about it. If we get messed up with or subjected to injustice, uh, you know, and it looks like we got, have no recourse. Uh, yes, we do. God is going to uh, take care of it. It says the Lord is merciful and gracious, um, slow to anger and abundant in mercy. So um, because God is merciful and gracious, that's why uh, a lot of the sins that we've committed, we ain't got the consequences that we, we should have uh, reserved, uh, should, uh, that we deserve, we haven't gotten it. However, the Lord is merciful and gracious, but we want to again push his patience because he also says a man who stiffens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken. Beyond remedy, uh, King James Burton shall suddenly be destroyed uh, beyond remedy. So in other words, we disobeying God. He keeps warning us, keep warning us. Preacher tell us something. Brother in Christ tell us something. Get out of my face. Look, man, let me run my own life. You worry about what you're doing. Those are reproofs from God. You think God going to come down from heaven, sit on the side of your bed and say, look, why don't you stop doing what you're doing because I don't want to have to hurt you. No, he ain't going to do that. He's going to tell you through your brothers and sisters in Christ. He's going to tell you when you read the Bible, if you read the Bible, and you better listen to what he said, because he who often being rebuked and hardens his neck, in other words, stiff neck, you won't let God turn you in the direction that you want to go, keep it up. You say you'll suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. That means when you get to hollering and crying, I repent, give me mercy, Lord, I ain't going to cut you no slack. But here's another thing about God. He will not always strive, neither will he keep his anger forever. God will judge us for our sins, but if we repent, he ain't going to stay mad at us. God said he don't get no pleasure out of afflicting us. He don't like to do that. And I know we can relate to that. Because ain't that the same thing your mama told you when she was whipping you? Ain't the same thing your daddy told you? My mama told me that. I don't like to whip you. I felt like saying, you act like you do. But she didn't. And I understood that once I became a parent. And all that, that that's a good attitude for a parent to have. That I don't take no joy out of afflicting uh, punishment on you, but it is necessary that I do it for your own good. Because if I don't, if I don't discipline yourself, the word of God says that uh, he who spares his rod hates his son. He who spares his rod hates his son. What you talking about, Lord? I don't hate him. I give him everything he wants. I let him go wherever you want to go. That's right. You couldn't do no worse to him if you hated him. You don't want to whoop him. He's too cute to whoop. You couldn't do him no more harm than if you hated him. Because you are uh, setting that child up uh, for destruction. Because when you get out on the street, a lot of people ain't going to put up uh, with this mess. So uh, God said, won't say, I won't keep my anger forever. You repent. You know, God don't carry grudges. So we repent. God takes that into consideration. Maybe a period of time that we have to suffer. But eventually, he'll lift it. You hear the psalmist are praying, praying to God, don't, don't, don't chase me in your hot displeasure. So yeah, God doesn't keep his anger However, he says he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our, our iniquity. So God didn't deal with us according to our sins before we got saved. And we, some of us were real crazy out there before we got saved, real wicked. But God didn't deal with us uh, according to our sins before we got saved. And he don't do it uh, since that we have uh, been saved. Uh, the sins uh, that we commit after uh, we've been saved. He ain't dealt with us according to what we really deserve. He ain't let us suffer where he could suffer. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 133, If Lord, you mark iniquities, who could stand? Woo! If God slapped me for every sin I committed since I've uh, been a Christian, I would have died about maybe uh, at the most a year after I got saved. I've been saved over 40 years. And if God dealt with me according to my failures as a Christian, I would have died a long time ago. Uh, but he hasn't dealt with us after our iniquities. Nor according to our sins. As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions from us. That is, when we sin against the Lord, uh, the sins that we did then, we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. The word of God said, God forgives you for everything that you ever did. And just to let you know how great his forgiveness is, he says, as far as the east is from the west, as far as the heavens is high above the earth, that's how far away he has removed our sin from us. Now, uh, the heavens include the stars, and the sun is a star. Now, the sun is approximately 93 million miles away from the earth. 
That's God giving us an idea of how far away he has moved our transgression from us. That is, he doesn't retain them in his memory and, uh, you know, keep bringing them back up again. Well, okay, I'm going to forgive you now, but you know, you uh, you did that back here. You know, you, you know, back in 74, uh, you did that too. No, God don't do that. Uh, and, you know, we shouldn't be keeping a record of people's sins against us. If they repent, if they repent, we should keep no record of the sins that people commit against us. That is... By keeping a record, I mean holding a grudge against them. Still mad at them. 16 years later, you still mad at them. God said, if you don't forgive men their trespasses against you, I won't forgive your trespasses against me. Because you see that they need mercy because they're wicked, but don't forget, you was in the same shape, and I poured out mercy on you, and I expect you to extend the same thing to them. At least we're going to at least pray for them, and I ask the Lord uh, that he would uh, save them. Uh, he says, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. And any father that's got his head on straight, as I was saying, you might have to whip your child. They might make you real mad. But if you're a father with your head on straight, you're going to still have compassion on them. And uh, here's why God has compassion on his children. For he knows our frame. He is mindful that we are does. God know that we're frail. Oh, we might. You know, think we all that. But God knows that we are frail. And he knows that if he kept on uh, 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 judging us or judging us the way we've seen, we have to leave here. So he knows that. So it says he knows our friends. We, 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 he remembers that we are dust. And then Psalm 103 verse 15 says, As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. What do you mean by that? The wind passes over it, the flower of the field, and it is gone. The place thereof shall know it. No more. God is comparing man's frailty. Man is temporary in his physicality. And God is comparing that uh, with his mercies, which never comes to an end. So um, it don't make no difference how much physical strength a man has. It don't make no uh, a difference what kind of attributes he has as far as he's, you know, he's brainiac. Uh, all like that. It don't make no difference in what possessions he's got, how much wealth he's got, how much esteem he's got in his life, how popular he is. It don't make no difference at the final analysis. I don't care how good they look. Just like that pretty flower. That pretty flower look good, but it don't take nothing to destroy it. And that's the same way as man. I don't care what kind of shape he's in. I don't care what he got. I don't care what kind of popularity or, or, or notoriety uh, that he has. It don't take nothing uh, to take him uh, 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 away from here. So man is temporal in a lot of sense in his, in his physical condition. Uh, but it don't take nothing to bring him to a permanent end as far as his life is concerned. But then here's the contrast. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting and his righteousness even unto children's children. And what he's saying here is God's mercy as opposed to man's transitoriness. You know, he's don't take nothing to take him away. Uh, God's mercy, God's loving kindness is eternal. There is no end to his mercy and his loving kindness. You know why? Because that's part of his character. His mercy and his loving kindness. God has always been merciful. God has always been merciful. He was merciful before he made the world. God uh, 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 demonstrated his mercy uh, in eternity past, if you will. Uh, God, before he made the world, and this just blows my mind. I don't even like to try to figure it out. God, before he created the heavens and the earth, decided to save me. And if you are a Christian, he decided to save you. Before he created the heavens and the earth, before he created Adam, he decided that he was going to save me. That was back in eternity past. Eternity future, he's still going to be merciful. Not that uh, once God uh, 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 sets up the new heavens and the new earth, he ain't going to have to have mercy on, on, on nobody then. Because everybody's going to be 100% righteous. The, the wicked, they done went to, uh, to the lake of fire. They're going to be there forever. But still, even though God is not going to say to us once we get to heaven, well, you messed up and I'm going to pour out mercy on you. No, but his mercy is still going to be on display. How is his mercy still going to be on display? By the fact that we're in heaven. Well, we didn't deserve to go. We're going to be in heaven, eternal glory, even though we made it necessary for Jesus to die 
on the cross. But God's mercy is eternal. And if this world uh, continues on in this uh, particular uh, condition for the next thousand years, and I hope it don't, but if it does, God is still going to be merciful. Because why? That is his character. The word of God says, Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. The word of God says, James 1 and 6, uh, 17 concerning God, in him there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God ain't like this one day and then the next day he like this. We can be like that. Oftentimes we are. But God ain't like that. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And just the mercy that he extended to us, he said uh, uh, to uh, our children. He'll extend it to our children. The same mercy that he extended to us, he'll extend, extend it to our children. And our children's children. If they fear him. If they fear him. Because they are not deserving of uh, heaven either. Nevertheless, he'll extend his mercy to our children, to their children, and to their children from generation to generation. Every generation that decides that they're going to uh, accept God's offer of salvation, repent of their sins, and submit to Jesus Christ, God is going to pour out his mercy upon them. Remember, they don't deserve it either, but he'll do it to those who uh, 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 fear him. So then he says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty, uh, King James Version says his kingdom, but it says his sovereignty rules over all. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Man thinks he's got this world under his control, but he's sadly, sadly mistaken. Man ain't thinking about God. We can handle this. We got this under our control. But man is sadly mistaken. God is ruling this earth from heaven. And you say, well, what, what about all the stuff that's going on? All the sin, all the murders, all the killing, all the shooting. It can't happen unless God allowed it to happen. And what did I say? Whatever God allows to happen, he's got a good reason for allowing it to happen. But what it is, some of us try to judge God by our standards. Well, that ain't right. That shouldn't be. That shouldn't be happening. That shouldn't be happening. God got more sense than we got. We got a flawed intellect, and we're looking at things and making judgments, making moral uh, uh, judgments from our flawed intellect. If you want to make, and if I want to make uh, accurate judgments about the condition of this world, look in the Bible. See what God says about it. Then we'll be on the right track. But yeah, God's going to rule this world. Jesus Christ is coming back. Read the second Psalm. Why does the heathen rage? And the people imagine the vain thing. The people will gather together against the Lord and his Christ. Man, is uh, if, if he could go to, go to heaven and uh, 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 oust God, he would do it. How do I know? Well, first of all, because I see how crazy people are. But that's another reason why I know from the word of God. Because we are told in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 11, we find Jesus coming back from heaven. Oh, he is going to come back. He's going to reveal himself to the world. We find Jesus coming back from heaven. Here's folks in the world fighting each other, trying to take control over the Middle East. For the oil and all the riches in the, in, in the Dead Sea, I guess. But the word of God tells us they're going to be fighting each other. And you can see how that can happen now. Because look at how, look how things are going now. Look how vicious man is now. But they're going to be fighting each other. And here comes Jesus. With the armies of heaven. And what's going to happen? They're going to stop fighting each other and turn to fight Jesus. Bad mistake. I got a... Uh, 13-year-old, maybe 14-year-old granddaughter. And uh, just kind of making a rough estimate, I would say she weighs maybe 115, 20 pounds. I don't know. Uh, maybe five feet, five or six inches tall. And then I got a son, her daddy, six foot, 202 million pounds. And she would be, and I thank God that she ain't, nutty as a fruitcake to try to fight my son. I wouldn't even fight him. But yet here's puny man who 
Before Christ coming, God is pouring out his wrath upon the earth, letting all kind of things happen. They know that it's God doing it because the word of God says they looked up to heaven and cursed God. They know it's him doing it. And yet, when they see Jesus coming, this is it. They're going to turn and try to fight Jesus. Bad decision. Bad decision. Can anybody say, don't slap Mike Tyson? Huh? But yeah, they're going to do that. So man thinks he's going to be in control of this world. Jesus is going to take control of this world. Then you're going to see justice like you've never seen it before. Uh, that's if you're a Christian. I hope you don't die in your sins. You know, I hope you're not here when that is known as the tribulation. When Christ returned, a man's going to try to fight God. I hope you ain't here and you're with the ones that took the mark of the Antichrist, took the mark of the beast. But that's another subject. But I hope you ain't. Because uh, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, when Jesus Christ comes to rule on the earth, we're going to reign with him as well. We're going to be in, in, in total uh, perfection. So, now I'm bringing this to conclusion. At the, at the beginning of this uh, psalm, uh, the psalmist uh, was telling himself, Bless the Lord, O my soul. He was telling himself to praise the Lord. And then he gave reasons why he should praise the Lord. Now, at the end of the psalm, he calls on the entire universe to bless the Lord. That is, to praise God. He said, bless the Lord, you angels of hills that excel in strength, hearkening to the voice of his word. He calls on the angels to praise the Lord, and they do. He said, let all of the hosts praise the Lord. All of God's servants praise the Lord. They do. All the works of his creation. They said, let all the works of creation praise the Lord, and they do. The heavens declare the glory of God. The, the heavens, the sky shows the power of God. When you're looking at the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe, the end of which we have never seen yet, that's showing the power and the wisdom of God. When you look at the things that God has provided for us here on the earth, what about these herbs that they get medicine from? That comes from God. What about uh, 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 the elephant, uh, the buffalo, the powerful animals? That comes from God. When we look at God's creation, talking about the heavens declare the glory of God and the, and, and the firmament shows his handiwork, and we look at the things on the earth, we see the power, we see the glory, we see the love of God. All we got to do is look, open our eyes, and look. The birds, they glorify God. How? By doing what they do. They do what God created them to do. We the only ones that's, you know, human beings and ain't got our head on straight. But everything else that God made, they do what God created him to do. They show the glory of God, the, the fowls of the air, not just the bird, but the butterflies, uh, uh, the beauty of the butterfly, the way a, a hummingbird could just stop in the air. That, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I, don't, I haven't seen it lately. I would like to see it again because some things about nature fascinate me. But I used to be watching a football game, and then they go to a commercial, and it was about this uh, insurance company, and they'd be playing this music. Dun, 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 And while they're playing this music, this whale jumps up out of the water and makes this tremendous flash. And I'd be sitting up there saying, how can anything that big and that heavy do that? Well, I know how they can do it because that's the way God programmed them. That's the way they do it. But the point I'm trying to get across is if you really take a look at nature, it is really fascinating. Even the trees in the, in, in the autumn. When they have the different colors, uh, yellow and orange and, 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 and light brown, you know, that shows the power of God. The medicinal herbs that we get uh, shows uh, the love of God. The good things that God gives us to eat show, uh, 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 shows us the love of God. And all these things are, are, are called the glory of God. So everything, even the ants and the worms, you know, a God program, an ant, ant God system up to store food for the winter. So they show the wisdom and the power of God. And it said, bless his holy name. Remember again, now name is talking about uh, uh, his character. And it says his character is holy. Bless his holy name. Praise him because of his holiness. God's holy character. Uh, we have a degree of holiness, but we ain't holy all the time. God always has been, he and now is, and he always will be holy. And nobody will ever have a higher a degree of holiness than God does because of who he is and how he is, he is separate from us. So everything declares the, gl the glory of God, everything he uh, created. Because, see, God created everything. Everything he created was good. He didn't create nothing bad, but we, we messed it up. 
We made it bad. But all these creatures declare the glory of God. They show that God is worthy of praise just by their existence, by the way that uh, they function. But uh, this, and I'm going to close, shouldn't we beat these creatures praising God and the angels? Shouldn't we beat the angels praising God? Because God didn't have to save them. He didn't have to pour out his mercy upon them because of transgression. But he had to do it for, uh, do it for us when we deserve nothing but hell. He cut us some slack. And I think about some of the things I used to do before I got saved, how I almost uh, could have got killed, and I didn't. Should not be able to praise God better than the angels? The truth of the matter is no. Not yet. But wait till I get to heaven. Because I'm going to be perfect then. I ain't got all these flaws. I'm going to have all these flaws uh, that I, I got now. But we should still, even at that, even though we got a sin nature, we still should be able to praise God, uh, many of us, I'll say, uh, a little better than we do. You know, God poured out his mercy upon us. He uh, uh, forgave all our iniquities. He heals all the diseases. He crowns us with uh, uh, glory and honor. And so I just think that we could do, can't we, a little better than we do when it comes uh, to praising God. So... I don't know, maybe you're in a conviction. But if you are, try doing what I do. Because frequently, I go to God and say, Lord, I'm asking you for mercy because I'm convinced that I'm not praising you, I'm not appreciating you nowhere near that I could and should be doing. But I'm asking you, Lord, to help me, to stir up my spirit, to give me a genuine uh, 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 in, uh, spirit of uh, praise and thanksgiving. Let me do it with enthusiasm. Let me do it uh, from my heart because Lord you are worthy of the very very best that I can do according to the power that you give me as far as offering you sacrifices of praises and thanksgiving so that's my message I hope that has been a blessing to you and I want to one more thing and uh, then I'm, I'm done and that is this uh, you can't praise God in a manner that is acceptable to him unless you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need your sins forgiven, and God is all too willing to forgive you of your sins. You just need to go to God and acknowledge that you are a sinner and ask him to forgive you. You need to put your trust in not how good you can do, not how, by reforming yourself, not by how going to church or giving money to the church, although God wants us to go to church once we get saved. But the only way that you can get God's forgiveness to acknowledge that you are a sinner and ask God to save you and put your trust in what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Because when he died on Calvary, he was taking the punishment for my sin, for your sins, and for the sins of the whole world. And all God wants you to do is to acknowledge that you're a sinner. Ask Jesus to save you, and he will do it as long as you mean it from your heart. And then God will help you to live. I say he will help you to live because temptation is going to come. But he will help you to live uh, the way that he wants you to live. So please don't delay. Once you die... It's too late. So, as the Bible says, now is the acceptable time. Now is the acceptable. Uh, now is the day of salvation. Accept Jesus while you got the chance. Thank you.